Hey guys, it's Adam from Mr. Pixel and welcome back. Today is not a time-lapse video of a painting. Today is a talking head video because I'd like to speak face to face uh, for a very important reason. I'd like to continue our conversation, at least the one I started a little while back on AI art, artificial intelligence art. The reason being is my original video was an initial impressions my original thoughts and feelings on the topic and i do continue to sh to to own those same thoughts and feelings but i've added quite a bit of nuance to those thoughts and feelings since because i've had a chance to listen to and experience the very wide-ranging opinions and feelings on ai art from every artist on the platform that I've listened to on it. And it's amazing how everybody can have a very different opinion and a very different emotional reaction from fear to anger to sadness to conspiracy theories to panic to excitement to indifference to confusion. And that everybody can have such incredibly different opinions, yet all be very right. And uh, it goes to show just how deep this goes for us artists. So I want to, I want to, I want to have this conversation with you, but furthermore, draw that line in the sand that we've all been trying to draw. Everybody's been trying their own way to draw a line in the sand, depending on how definitive their opinion is. And it's actually a line in the sand that my friend Hardy Fowler, fellow YouTuber, who we did a podcast about this uh, just a couple of weeks ago, which you, I recommend you watch that before watching this. Uh, you can check it out right there because, um, and it's also in the description, because he's the one who I feel really handed me the key to unlock the real answer to this. So, where do I start? Well, I'm going to start with what I, what I actually... Um, um, conveniently watched just because it showed up on my YouTube feed uh, only a few hours before I sat down with Hardy to have that conversation. I watched a video on a topic that I find very fascinating and very evocative and very intri intriguing, art forgery, real live art forgery. Um, and I've watched several, there's the Forger's Masterclass, a former art forger who was caught and went to jail and then decided to teach people his techniques on how to learn from the masters. And this was another art forger, I can't remember what his name is, but a very successful one. One who managed to fake Picassos and Modiglianis and Sargents. A quite, quite an accomplished forger. And it made me think, why is that wrong? When, if you think about it, objectively, I haven't heard a single artist um, not claim, myself included, that they don't steal from other artists. Artists steal all the time, in a sense. I quote David Bowie, who was interviewed once and said, yes, I steal from everybody. I steal from a multitude of different things simultaneously, package it together, sprinkle a little bit of David, Bo David Bowie magic and call it my own. He creates everything that way. Everything that I create has been referenced and in a sense stolen from multitudes of different artists. So what makes a forger so terrible? Well, what makes a forger a forger, as opposed to just somebody who is referencing and inspirationally stealing from different sources, is not the art theft. It's the identity theft, right? A forger is perfectly, is perfectly welcome to do something in the style of their favorite artist. My art is very much a, a culmination of Miyazaki and Frazetta and Bekshinsky and many other artists. You know, Marcin Nagraba, the guy who does those paganistic type of costume designs and, and you name it. I have an entire very elaborate reference Pinterest board and stuff like that, which is my, my fuel for art. I am, in essence, stealing from a much, bunch of people. Crossing the line is when I claim to be somebody else, when I claim to own a piece from somebody else. That's identity theft. And it's the identity 
that makes the artist, is it not? Because that identity isn't just what they produce. The, the identity, their identity is their provenance, meaning where they came from, what what surrounds the art, the story behind it, the personality behind the, behind the artist, the time, the food they ate, the homes they live in. Rembrandt is not just a lighting style. Rembrandt is not just a rendering style. He is a mark of the times. He's a mark of his culture and his relationship with his mother and his the type of lighting situation he had in his house at the times, depending on the era he came from and how that influenced how he created and how he observed the world and it's his personal philosophy and his the conversations with he, that he had with his friends. And not, not to mention all of the struggles and ups and downs he had throughout his career, the successes and failures. I'm not just a drawing. I'm an entire identity tied up in my art. I am a culmination of the people I love and hate. I am a cul culmination of the things that I that I care for and the things that disgust me and the things that, that excite me and the things that bore me and the things that make me sad. I am a very complex creature and my art is a manifestation of that. When you claim to be somebody else, you're not just stealing their art, you're stealing their existence. In fact, I would argue that you're stealing the, the, the very thing that I would argue and that I, I talk to my students about is the most important thing to myself, to them, and every other human being on this planet. Yes, that's a very big claim. And I ask this question of my students. I say, what is the most important thing in the world to you and to me and to every other person on this planet? You're not sure? It's humanity. Humanity is the most important thing to you and I. Ask yourself the question, why are we so intrigued by the walking dead? Why are we so fascinated with the pyramids of Egypt? Why are we so, why are we, why do we hold such sentimental value? Some, why do we value antiques, family heirlooms? Why does it matter so much to me that these rings that I wear are handmade. Why do I pay for that? Why do I value that fact? Because it's not something that was made by a machine. It was something that was made by a human. So when I put this ring on and I look at this ring over here, okay? When I look at it, I don't see perfection. I see excellence. I see skill. I see the time it took for these master silver crafters in Bali who could translate a drawing, a sketch into a three-dimensional sculpture that some person can wear on their, on their body. And I feel that artist's connection. In fact, this one is very special to me because I designed this one. I did. And I'll get back to that in a sec. So to me, I'm an artist who is hired by Clocks and Colors, by Vitaly, um, because I reached out to them and they asked, and he was super awesome and let me. And I created designs for him. And then months later, maybe a year later, he let me know that it was created. And I got to see and finally one day open up the box and put this on my finger. And if you think about what this, what this ring represents to me as an artist, as a person, I'm an artist who spent his entire life developing an aesthetic style, developing a voice artistically. I recognized a kindred spirit in terms of an artistic aesthetic in Clocks and Colors, in Vitali, in Ida Love, in these companies that produce this, this jewelry, and reached out to him and said, could I do a design for you? I really, I really click with your aesthetic style. And he looked at my work and he said, yeah, I see that. And he gave me this opportunity. And I spent weeks designing all of these different rings and jewelry and stuff like that. We settled on a couple of um, finals. And then months later, he sent this design to somebody in Bali on the other side of the planet, <clears throat> excuse me, in India, and who sat down and crafted a mold and filled it with silver and sculpted it and added all of the fine details to it 
and then polish it up with his polishing cloth, put it into a box, sent it back to Canada, and then they shipped it off to me from Ontario. I'm in Montreal, and I open up the box, and there it is. There's this creation, okay? And I looked at it, and I didn't see something that I put a quarter into a machine, cranked the handle, out popped, a, out popped some ring. No. To me, this is a human experience. This is a memory. There is a human connection in this thing that I have created. And as an artist, one of the most important things that you can ever possibly learn is the importance of what it is I'm telling you right now. And the more gifted, the more expressive, the more of a storyteller, the more of yourself you you invest and inject into your own work, the more you're going to realize what I'm telling you right now is very, very important and very, very true. Okay? It's the humanity. And stealing somebody's name is stealing their humanity. It is stealing from them the most precious thing that they own. The most important precious thing that anyone will own. Pay attention to everything in the world from relationships, to the way people talk, to the way people express, to the way people eat, to the homes and the environments that you enter, to the lighting in your room, to the plants on the walls and sitting on the floors, to the animals and the creatures that you have a relationship with or not, to the people who you love and hate, to the locations that you love going to and hate going to, to the experiences that give you joy, to the experiences that make you sad, to the make, to experiences that make you feel ter terrified. And you realize every single one of these things tie in to your existence, to your humanity. And the things that you don't value, the things that have no sentimental value to you, are the things that don't have that life, that do not have that humanity in them. Why do people love the pyramids of Egypt? Why, do pe why are people in love with with artwork and creations by artists past because it is a it is a conduit it is a it is a lens into our ancestry our past that is no longer there and when it's no longer there it become we fear it's losing it we fear losing its existence a person's existence is the most valuable fundamental thing i'm i live in montreal quebec which is a province that in its that that a lot of people who live here, particularly the French Quebecers, um, fear losing, because Quebec is the only purely French province. We have both; it's Canada, so we have English and French here predominantly. But but French Quebecers, francophones in Quebec, fight for sovereignty. Fight for sovereignty very often. They want to separate from Canada. And this has become a very, very challenging political topic for Canadians in general. Because Canadians don't want Canada to break up. I love Canada too. I don't want Canada to break up, to break up. But I very much do empathize with how French Quebecers in Quebec fear being consumed, fear being becoming obsolete, getting pushed out, having their culture lost because this is their existence. This is their identity the music, the culture, the food, the philosophy, the love, the relationships, the land itself. And the same can be said for any very deep-rooted culture on this planet. It is your identity. It is your humanity. And this is where AI comes into it. When you steal somebody's identity, if you claim, like what the point that Hardy had made with me was he said, one of the things that really kind of tipped the skills for me was when um, somebody just punched in Hardy Fowler style art and had actually programmed Hardy's aesthetic, Hardy's um, very long earned skills into this algorithm and it pumped out something that could possibly be made by him. Right, and he was. He said, "I'm sure if you put more work into it, they would probably be able to do a better job." But something felt wrong about that. He said he couldn't quite put his finger on it, but it just it crossed a line for him. And it, that's what gave me pause. That's what made me think. And I realized, 
by just doing Hardy Fowler art, that could the act of just copying somebody or copying somebody's style is, I mean, look at manga, look at anime, look at Disney art. That's literally copying Disney. That's literally copying every other anime artist out there. That's why 99% of my students always have anime, manga, manga portfolios. Do I call them all thieves? No. They're inspired by a very specific niche style of art. There's nothing wrong with that. But if my student said to me, oh yeah, I did that. That's my art. And I said, yeah, but I can tell that's Bobby Chu's painting. I've seen it. I know that's Bobby Chu's work. You're claiming to have a style. You're claiming to own something that somebody else did who I know. You are literally pretending to be somebody else. That's identity theft. That steals a person's humanity, that steals a person's existence and profits from it. When it comes to AI art, that's the problem. When art, when AI art becomes forgery, when AI art becomes the theft of somebody's identity, saying, yes, I own an authentic Adam Duff creature design over here. Yeah, that's mine. And then Adam looks at it and goes, the f I did. I never drew that. And this is why artists have such incredibly strong emotional reactions to those claims. And art, what makes art art is not just the image. It's not, that's just the shell of what it is. I am no, lo no more uh, an illustrator as I am a jewelry designer. I hold both of these things in equal regard because... They both came from me. They're things that I'm proud of. And in fact, the fact that I had the opportunity to be able to collaborate with so many other gifted people makes this even more precious to me. And when I look down at this ring, it has great sentimental value to me. And that's the line that can't be crossed. That's where us artists have to say, stop, you've gone too far. And that line in, at that particular point is not just an ethical line. It's a legal line. It's identity theft. And that should be addressed and handled swiftly and legally, in my opinion. If anybody claims to own you, then they're stealing your identity. And that is, by, by definition of the law, illegal. So that said, where in all of this can AI art be exciting? And where it excites me is in the is in regarding it as a very powerful extension to what we already do every single time we sit down to draw. Reference. One of the biggest challenges that, that us artists can face, particularly when we're telling a very specific story, creating a very specific work of art that has that has very specific criteria, is getting access to accurate, reliable information. A very good example is my painting Mavka or Rusalka, which is for nude women swimming underwater in some swampy water who are drowning a man, tangling a man in their long hair and drowning him to death. One must ask the question, where does that reference come from? Well, do you see any life-sized aquariums behind me with nude women swimming in it with excessively long hair? No. You don't. So how did I paint that with any level of realism? I had to reference it. Where did I find those references? How do I get those specific poses? How do I get those specific appearances? How do I pose them together in a way that creates a nice fluid composition that allows the eye to travel through the composition in a nice way? A lot of time and effort. And I went, I went through, I had to jump through quite a few loops just to get the right proper references in the most ethical ways because I needed access to something that I didn't have immediate access to. So getting those references together was a very painstaking, laborious pro process to get something that I could rely on to be able to produce that work of art. Getting access to incredibly specific, diverse visual reference is extremely challenging and it, being able to uh, tap into a resource that would allow me to enter in a couple of criteria and find very very specific image references is an absolute godsend uh, ergo josh did a video recently where he talked about how much art has evolved as a result of um our ability to research things online i remember what the world was like 
for an artist back in the 1980s and 90s um, when we didn't have access to these image references. We didn't have access to this information. We didn't have access to these things as quickly and as efficiently as we did today. And you can see that art has grown very quickly. We have benefited hugely from this access, not to mention our ability to mix mediums from photography to photo bashing to 3D to 2D, to be able to compile them together to create imagery that we couldn't even imagine creating. And one, uh, ergo Josh, I recommend checking out his video right over here, had talk, spoke about somebody he had spoken to who said, if I look back at the artwork that I was producing at this age, at this time, I probably wouldn't have gotten a job back then because the standard has gone up so quickly. AI art has the potential as Google has offered us the potential or Pinterest has offered us the potential or SketchUp or Mudbox or Maya or 3ds Max has unlocked the potential for us to grow in a very, very exciting way because we get access to that specific information we're looking for. Instead of Frankensteining together some photographs in Photoshop, that will feel like a very primitive method for compiling image references in the next 10 years if AI is used that way. This is exactly what Adobe really emphasized in their latest Adobe conference and when they're talking about their implementation of AI in an ethical way as a tool integrated directly into Photoshop where artists could dig into a data bank without ever having to leave the app. This excites me and I'm also very reassured that Adobe is um, is keeping their enemies closer. They're, they're smart about this. They understand the fact that AI is here. Like it or not, trillions of dollars have been invested into AI art. It is, a, it is here, it is pre present, and it's moving forward. But an authority in art, like Adobe, are taking a stance. They are owning this conversation and they're implementing it in a way to show people through example, this is the ethical use of AI. And if you don't do it this way, if you try it that way, you're, you're crossing a line and we'll sue your ass for that. So I thank Adobe for the position they're taking on this so far. I don't think that the, I can't see them having any intention of abusing that position, but we'll see. I don't think so though. But it's also us to up to us as individuals to recognize when identity theft is happening. When somebody is holding up your passport and saying, yeah, that's me. Because that is trying to steal your humanity. That is trying to steal the most precious thing that you or I or any other human being on this planet will ever own. This is the foundation of who we are. And if we don't protect that, yes, terrible things will happen to us. Well, think about what it would feel like if anybody can claim to be you. If somebody can just come in and say, yeah, yeah, that's my art. And if you say, no, it's not, I never painted it. And they say, prove it. And you can't. Then it's your word against them. They basically in five seconds are claiming to be something that is taking you an entire lifetime to become. They have stolen your identity. They have stolen, in a sense, your purpose, your voice. And that is very horrible. So I think all of our teachers over the years have had a very, very good point. Uh, my teacher who, for instance, uh, was commenting on my son Lucas's math homework. She said, he'll present me with the solution, but I didn't want to see the solution. I wanted to see the process. The showing the process alone is worth 20% of that mark. In my humble opinion, moving forward, it's going to need to count for a lot more than that. In my opinion, what we're going to start seeing moving forward is that our process, your process, my process, the YouTube videos you watch where you can see the time-lapse video of my painting and where I start things over and where that painting evolves and where my thought process changes and where I start to come, start to gather further references and watch videos by other artists because my technique is a little bit weaker here or there and where I reference other people and talk about different people and the relationships that I feel I've created with other artists who I've never met in my entire life because they influence me, because they've left a lasting impact on me as an artist and as an individual, that is going to count for 95% of the process. And the only, the only 
the, uh, the that last five percent of the process will be here there's the finished result and it's the humanity in your work that creates that is the connection this tattoo these tattoos on my arms I didn't wa I didn't stick my hand in a device press a button and it went Tsh! and I pulled it out and I went oh pretty no I sat down for dozens and dozens of hours with incredibly talented artists that had to learn about skin and ink and art technique. They had to take art classes. They had to learn about different tools. They had to find a job. They had to find ergonomic chairs so that they don't bust their backs. Tattoo artists are always fucking up their back working. So we're, <laughs> they need to find more ergonomic ways for, for tattoo artists to work. To the peop, the clients they've had to head, to the to the bodies they've had to touch, to the to the being able to professionally disassociate from the fact that you might be looking at a very private part of a complete stranger while you're doing your job. So, same way a doctor might. And we, I sat down for hours and hours and got to know them. Mimi Sama, who produced this over here, the Temet Noske, Know Thyself. Okay, how ironic is that? Or the part of this part of my sleeve, or Julie Hamilton, who finished off the rest of my sleeve over here. These are people I care about. These are people who I respect. These are people who I waited for to have their art on my body. And when I look down at, at this art on me, I don't think, nice drawing. No, I think about her face. I think about her voice. I think about watching her draw. I'm thinking about the conversations we had about their kids. And we, I think about the conversations we had about how Julie Hamilton is, was extremely surprisingly uh, as big a uh, 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 George Carlin fan as I was and we had all these conversations about philosophy and I was my god did we have great conversations like really we shared a lot of similarities in that regard or you know how how Mimi Sama had you know she was a manga artist predominantly and she was working in in Canada but she originally came from France and she worked in multiple different countries around the world and she ended up moving to the states which is the reason why she couldn't finish my sleeve there's stories there's memories i see them on instagram i look at the works that they're doing and i'm saying i know her i've we've marked each other's lives it's the human behind the art and it's the human that i care about and it's the human that makes this art precious to me like these rings like these tattoos and like you that you are precious to me not the image you create it's the person behind the art so that's the thing you need to protect more than anything else if it's a tool to help you be better at who you are then i'm all for it but if it's a tool that tries to steal you or claim you or pretend to be you that isn't only unethical that dear lady and gentlemen is illegal and that needs to stop with that said Thank you very much for joining me. I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.